LGPP projects are very unique for local sponsor agencies. The consultants preparing the plans, as well as for Textile and HGAC. As you can see, they're not like any typical a typical agency project or even a typical textile project. There are many unique factors that can lead to challenges that might prevent or delay the project letting. Understanding these typical problems, understanding what is encountered, how to anticipate these issues, and then options for solving them is going to be the topic of this panel. What we want to do is to help some of the local agencies and the consultants identify typical pitfalls that can occur in a real project and how to work with TxDOT, HGAC, and the project consultants in order to get the job to letting. We also want to get, again, your questions and comments that you, on what you've experienced and some of your lessons learned. Our two panelists today are two gentlemen who have been, been and are, very, are currently very involved in the LGP process and that is Richard Stolice and Matt Hanks. Let me give you a brief intro to both of these gentlemen. Richard Stolice is a county engineer for Fort Bend County. He joined Fort Bend County in April 2012, having previously worked as a city engineer, principal engineer, and a design engineer for both the private and public sector. And he has worked on several LGPP projects, including currently the ongoing West Park FM 1093 extension projects. He graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1979 with a BSCE. Matt is the county engineer for Brazoria County. Matt rejoined Brazoria County in this role in November 2013, having previously worked as an assistant county engineer from 2004 to 2007. Matt also has worked as an engineer in both the private and public sector and he is currently working on several LGPP projects for Brazoria County, including the Blue Water Highway Revetment Project and the Brazoria County Expressway Project. He also graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1997 with a bachelor's BS in architectural engineering and followed it up with a law degree from the South Texas College of Law. Let's just give these, both these gentlemen a round of applause. One thing that is unique, yes, you, you are seeing uh, three uh, University of Texas graduates up here at one time. Probably a very unique uh, situation. So, uh, um, But what I'm going to do is have each of these uh, gentlemen start and give a brief description of their experience in these type of projects and what they've learned. Starting with Matt, who's kind of going to go into the implementation of projects and then lead that into Richard, who's going to, I mean, the, Matt's going to deal, discuss the project setup and issues that they've had. And then uh, Richard is going to come in and discuss issues that he's had, lessons learned on the project implementation. And then we'll ask questions afterwards. So, Matt? I appreciate that, Todd. Um, I appreciate everybody that worked so hard to put this thing together. This is a great event. I think it's a huge benefit uh, to have something like this. So, to all the people that worked hard, thank you. Uh, when Todd actually called me up and asked me to sit on this panel, I was thinking, man, I can't believe they asked me to sit on this panel and there's so many qualified people in this room that have delivered so many projects. Then I saw what the panel was, was titled, it was dealing with the unexpected, which means problems, and yet that makes sense. I, I, I create a lot of problems. So I now know why Mark wanted me to sit on this panel. Um, but with that being said, uh, I know Todd's going to grill us with a lot of questions that we'll get into a lot of detail down here in a couple of minutes. So really what I wanted to do is just kind of walk through some very general points that, I, that when setting up these projects and thinking about these projects, which projects are we going to go after federal funds? Which projects do we want to local ed? You know, some criteria that I've been working on and how we want to handle these going into the future. One is pick the right project. I know for myself, the type of project, the size of project, at, for Brazoria County, there, there does get to be a point that, no, this is more of a locally funded project, we just, we're just going to do it in-house, or no, we want to go and we want to uh, seek federal funds and we want a local let. Uh, ownership of the project helps us determine whether we want a local let or do we want to you know, not go the local let route. Uh, county facilities, definitely. We, we, the county facilities that we're going to own and operate that there's no state participation in, just federal participation, we want a local 
we want to look at those projects. We don't want to, you know, we, those are the type of projects we want to have a little bit more control in. Uh, also, know your agency limitations. Um, I, I know uh, we're extremely busy with our staff in Brazoria County, and that creates some challenges. So, to local at every project is a little bit of a difficult task, but it does take a little bit extra time. So know your, know your staff experience, make sure you have staff that is experienced, knows how to drive projects, knows how to work schedules on projects, and knows how to coordinate with people. Uh, staff availability is important. And then political will to continue through this process because there's going to be challenges. I'm, there's not been a single project I've ever been involved in that doesn't have challenges. So you want that political will there to support you and be behind you the whole way. Uh, understand TxDOT's role in this. You're going to be working a lot with TxDOT, and I, I think before you get into this, you need to understand that TxDOT didn't really ask to be in this role. They're, they're asked, they've been asked to be in this role. They, they're, they're there to make sure that everybody's complying with federal requirements. It's not a role that, that I, 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 don't, I don't want to speak for TxDOT. It's not a role that I think they particularly want to be in. They, they have to be in. So understand that. Understand they have a lot of projects going on too. They're not just sitting here. Your project's not the only one. And so to some extent, when dealing with them, it, it, I have to say this, but they've got a lot going on. So your project is, I don't want to say a low priority, but it's not the high priority either. They're, they're trying to, as Mark said, put them in a conveyor belt and it's just working through the process. And then, uh, then pick the right team also, and that's, that's something that I know is, is always a challenge. And when I say the right team, it's not just pick the right consultant. And there is some tricks to picking the right consultant, but it's also making sure you have your staff, the right staff for that project. And what I mean by that is not just the knowledge of how to do a project, but also the, the, the staff that has the tools to communicate effectively. Cause that's really where the staff comes in, is making sure that all lines of communi communication stay open between all stakeholders. Uh, but pick the right consultant. When, I, when I'm looking at it, I know we got a number of consultants in the room, uh, and you know a number of qualified consultants in the room. But really when a consultant comes down to it, and I've worked as a consultant as well, and I've probably been one of the non-qualified consultants in the past, so, but, but when you're looking at that consultant, it's not just do they have that LGP certification that's that's important but you're wanting to look for somebody that understands TxDOT and understands their, their and has relationships with TxDOT and knows how to speak TxDOT I mean it's a whole other language and I know I'm sorry but you're good points I gotta take them <laughs> anyway but you know you, you, you want a consultant that has those relationships and know, knows how to work with them um, and this is kind of where I get into to Richard's presentation, I'll, I'll wait, and I'll turn it over to Richard. Learn how to communicate with TxDOT, even as a staff. Staff is going to have to be uh, involved in these projects. You can't expect the consultant to do everything. So learn how to communicate with TxDOT and know and learn to be a partner with them on it. And and this is my last note before I turn it over to Richard to give his little spill. I, I, I personally believe in over communicate. Now I don't always do a great job of that, but but to some extent, I've noticed with, with de working these projects through over communication is the best thing. I, I love people telling me, well, yeah, we, you've already told me that, or, or we've are, we're already doing that. But I just, I just love to constantly overly communicate. When I don't overly communicate, that's where we have problems, and that's where we've experienced problems. So the way I look at it is I want to over explain, I want to over talk, I want to, I want to, I want to invite that pretty girl to the dance three times if I have to. You know, I want to just constantly be asking, uh, making sure that they're engaged. So that that's kind of where I'm at, and I guess I'll turn it over to Richard now. Well, the good news is about three quarters of what I wrote down to talk to y'all about has already been talked about. So I can shorten this up and we can go to lunch early. So that's my that's my game plan for as a fat guy. A lot of support here. But uh, we we sat down and, and boosted Matt and I did with Todd about how we were gonna handle this and, and uh, you know, a couple of the things that came out of it is we were just sitting around the table chatting were things like speak text dot and uh, and become CSJ illiterate, I guess. You know, when you're 
when you're in the, I'm in the county, I've been in the local government business, when you're not dealing with textile on a regular basis, there's a lot of new lingo, a lot of new things you need to know to really be successful. So as a consultant, um, those of you that are, you're a link between the local agency and, and the state. So it's really critical that again, kind of following on what Matt said, communication, I don't think, I don't think we could overemphasize that enough. And, it, and um, you know, as, as David was talking earlier about, about their oversight, I look at it as they're going to, if they perceive that you're new to this process, that you're maybe a little less uh, able because you don't, you haven't been through all these hoops, they're going to be watching a little closer. But to me, that means when you pick up the phone and call, they're going to they're going to answer that phone quickly, and they're going to be a resource for you rather than a, than impunitive. Um, and so that's the way I kind of look at it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the different steps of, of the project and, and give you a couple of places where um, where maybe I can, can give you some perspective from what I've learned. And uh, Mark Patterson, on my note sheet it says, understand you are one of many. That's as project initiation. I didn't ask that question expecting Mark to tell you what, what he told you. But, but even from my perspective, just with my experience, my limited experience with Textile, that is one thing you got to understand. And, and you got to communicate that to your leaders, as Matt had mentioned, because it, it does take longer. There are more things you have to do. But, but you can get through it, and, you can, and it can benefit everyone if you take it in the right, in the right stride. Um, environmental client, uh, in compliance, I think one of the big things that was mentioned earlier, uh, Stu, I think you mentioned an environmental scoping document. What in the world is something like that? I can tell you that it's really pretty important. And from my, my experience, one of the things that, that really set us back for probably six months or so was a, the project that, that was mentioned, the 1093 project. We actually did acquisition, because we had development going on, we did acquisition and deals before we had an AFA. So, you know, when you look back, you think, well, we, we did it right. We did everything that we should have done. The, the, we had a willing seller, uh, someone who wanted to develop, but they didn't want to just donate all the right away. They, they weren't obligated to. And so we went through processes. I can tell you we spent agonizing months working with my county attorney trying to come up with how to explain what we did in a way that could fit in the box so that we could check that box and move on just to get environmental approval in our phase one. It, it's, it's not that we did anything wrong. We just did, couldn't say all the words that we needed to say exactly the way we, they, exactly the way they appear on that check box. We had to talk our way through it and it, and it took a lot of help from the environmental folks at TxDOT as well as my staff and my uh, county attorney to finally find a way to, to bridge the gap. And, and we, like I said, we didn't do anything wrong we just didn't have the documentation they were looking for. So uh, once you get through, you know, you get you get the project going, you're you're starting your your environmental obviously hand in hand with that is preliminary engineering and uh, and your preliminary design. You you have the design conference that was mentioned earlier. Getting that design concept down and getting getting that in place to make sure everybody knows what you're doing is really important. And I think one of the things that comes out of the LGPP uh, training is always make sure everybody on the team has the AFA, knows what's in the AFA, understands the AFA. Uh, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, I refer back to that or my consultants ask me a question, I could go right back at them. Did you look at the AFA? It'll answer that question for you. Uh, really important, a link that, that uh, and the training that they do really helps you understand some of those pieces. The, the big booger in the, in the room is always right away acquisition and utilities utility relocations. All I can say is start early, start early, start early, <laughs> and work hard, you know. And, and they're building a team specific that, that works um, on the right-of-way side of it in particular, and on the utility relocation side to get agreements in place. Uh, really, really important <coughs> that you look at that early. One of the obstacles we faced was the widening effect to the pipeline. It was in an easement. Well, an easement is property right. Now you've got to relocate that pipeline. Everybody gets that, the engineers you know, are focused on that, but have you thought about taking right away that's encumbered by an easement? 
would have been nice to have thought about that, you know, at the very beginning of the project and plan for a utility uh, pipeline easement adjoining your right of way or extra right of way. You know, and I was talking about other utility problems. Get enough right of way to be able to handle those kind of things and identify that early because when it comes up late, folks, it costs money and it's not pretty. I had one that we that we didn't handle in a way that I was happy with. My consultant's very aware of that, and uh, and we but we got our way through it. And, and you know, you just have to keep pushing, and you finally get there. So that's that's one of those lessons learned. I don't know whether it's a typical problem, but hopefully you can avoid it. Uh, PSNE, you know, finally you get through all that other stuff. You think, gosh, are we ever going to get to design the project? Now you're in PSNE, and now you're on Mark's uh, conveyor belt. You know, you've got to got to work your way through that. It takes time, but if you communicate, I really think that that you can make it. There's, you know, little things like um, Buy America and things like that that if you haven't been through the training and not really aware, they, they're not really obstacles, but they're additional things that you need to make sure you comply with. And documentation, the documentation of what you're working through, there's there's easy checklists to make sure at each step of this that you follow the regulations, you document that, and put it together. Five months later, you get to go to bed. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> but there is a there is a you know light at the end of the tunnel because you're getting towards construction, uh, and you have to you have to go through the steps. You have to have concurrence from TechStop for your approval of your contract, and that always gives my purchasing agent the willies, but. But we work our way through it. You know, you're trying to mesh two different operations, and that are handled different ways, and, and it can be done. It's just you just have to be aware of the differences. You finally get to construction, and this is where you get the fun part. And they hand you off to the area office. You know, when my 1093 project went to the area office, um, I think three of the guys that were that were there that were prim the primary guys we deal with all all retired within about four months of us getting started. So. Uh, fortunately, uh, Grady Makes came in and stepped up, and, and his guys have done a good job. But the, we were talking about the risk earlier. They they sat down with us early and made several of our, our construction meetings. They saw who I had on the team, who was watching the work, who our inspectors were, what we were doing as far as our material testing and everything else. They, they're comfortable, as I talked to Grady today, they're comfortable that we know what we're doing. We've got good, uh, experienced people on the job, and they they are following through with the paperwork, et cetera. We see his folks out on the job occasionally, but he's got I-69 to get built. He doesn't have a whole lot of time to come over and spend up a lot with us. But if he had if he had someone who didn't have the team out there, I would say he would be there on a much more regular basis. They're pretty comfortable and we talk regularly. So those are the kind of things that you help each other. The part I'm still hoping to get to is project closeout. I haven't gotten to that point yet, so one of these days I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to sit up here and tell you it's not as bad as you think. Uh, but document, document, document. I think that's probably the, the one thing that, that you learn. And in, in, uh, you know, my my guys on my in the field on my construction team said, now you know you're going to need about 26 three three drawer file ca uh, uh, cabinets when we get done with this. So you better get ready. And my staff's going, what? <laughs> Where does that paper go? But that's the kind of stuff you end up with. Uh, we also implemented uh, using some electronic uh, communications for change orders and all that, and that's really helped us a lot. And uh, those are the kind of things you just got to be ready for. Communicate, speak tech style, uh, be be aware of, of what your go goals are to get that compliance in place. In my case, I've got a commissioner's court looking at me saying, where's my $40 million? And uh, in our case, we're, we have a another level thrown in, which is a toll road in the middle of it. And so it's a little different arrangement. We don't get paid until we open the toll lanes. So I've got $40 million at risk that I've got to get everything done right so I can get that money. So with that, let's go to lunch. I know I'm getting hungry too. That's a, um, let me just ask y'all a couple questions. Um, I know uh, you kind of mentioned something, Richard, about the, uh, Kind of some of the typical pitfalls you've had on some projects. So, Matt, I'm going to ask you kind of what are some recent uh, pitfalls that you have had on a project, and and then how did you solve that? Um, I'm not sure if we got enough time to go through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but 
typical pitfalls. You know, I, I got a great example of what we just went through on, on the expressway, and, and we can get into that. But I, I know some typical pitfalls have been utilities. Um, utilities have been a headache on almost every project I've we, we've done at the county and that I've been involved in. So I'm not sure if there's a great way to handle that except for document. But going back to what Richard said, those document, 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 and there's really no winning there. Um, but on, on 288, one of the, you know, since we're talking about not really typical, <coughs> typical problems, we're talking about unexpected problems. You know, I, most of y'all have probably heard we just we had to rebid our expressway project, and that was our toll lanes project because that and that was completely unexpected. In fact, we in the bids, we, we thought, well, this is fantastic. You know, we you know came in lower than we expected. We were ready to have cake and ice cream and just celebrate, just saying this has been fantastic. We get a we get a contractor throw in a a protest on it. And we first start working through the initial protest, and we start finding that our bid documents had issues, right? And this, these are bid documents that were prepared by a consultant that's a highly qualified consultant. They were reviewed by uh, my, you know, my staff. They were reviewed by TxDOT. And when we got into it, we we found five of the six firms didn't turn in all the necessary documentation that the bid documents required, which you know, <coughs> stealing from. You know, Latin ipso facto that means you got a problem with your probably your bid documents. So, you know, of the five or the, the the one that did turn in the documents, they were the third low bidder, and they were the ones that was one of the pro was part of the protest that was originally started. It. So here we are having to rebid the do the project, but in before we can even rebid, we have to redo the bid documents and work them through TxDOT and get the bid documents reapproved. And uh, agree to so once again and that's kind of where I go back to over communicate when Mark and I worked real close together on that Mark's team was fantastic to work with but it they were they probably got tired of hearing from me you know just calling and asking where are we at on the review where are you at on this can we meet I, I think I came up I, I should have just gotten an apartment or a hotel up here close to text ops because we came up here and met so often but it that's that's how you have to handle the issues when they came up. So we got the project rebid. And, you know, I, I might be the luckiest guy in the world that came in lower because if it came in higher, I, I probably had a lot of explaining to do. But that's just what you have to do to, to handle issues. I think that that's just part of that process. Um, you know, mentioned several things, and several of the other speakers have mentioned about having the right team. Um, kind of what can some of the consulting, some of the consultants, some of your partners do uh, to try to help avoid some of these unexpected uh, situations? I know documentation, documentation is important. Um, how can a consultant do a better job of documentation, for example, to help y'all so that some, some of these don't? I'll go with the green light. Okay. I don't know that I can answer the question, but I'll, but I'll say, I think it's the, from my perspective, it's, it's the education of the LP, LGPP process. Um, it's understanding the guidelines and, and having uh, attention to that. Uh, you know, even on my county projects, you know, my engineers will tell the commissioner, well, I finished the design goes why aren't you bidding it well he forgot to mention that we're still waiting on right away maps you know I mean it's just little things like that so the process here is is not unlike anything maybe that you do in-house it's got other things that go on so as a consultant the number one thing you can be is a resource to understand what you're trying to accomplish and it's not just get a, a set of drawings out on, on the street there's much more to it uh, it's not that complicated, it's not that difficult, but if you don't pay attention to it and you don't then document what you've done, you end up, you know, against these problems. I mentioned my environmental problem, you know. Who, in, you know, when I started this deal and I'm saying, no, wait a minute, my environmental document is held up 
because of something I did on right away before I even had an AFA in place. How does that all tie together? Those are the kind of things that a consultant will help you identify up front. Now when something comes up relative to right away, my first question is I look at my consultant and say, we need to make sure that if we do this, that we're not going to create a problem with our environmental doctor. So it's little things like that that I think really define what the right team is. It's the people that communicate together and solve problems ahead of time. Because if you wait until it happens, you're dead in the water. You know, there goes another four months and your commissioner or your council member is wondering what in the heck. And then, you know, the whole the whole process gets a negative and oh we'll never do that again. Um, that defeats the purpose of what we're all about. It's trying to add concrete on the ground and, and help mobility. Well, for some people, I guess they don't want to add concrete, but most of us do. I, I, just to throw in with Richard here, I, I think the number one thing for a consultant, just my opinion, is understand what you can do and understand what you can't do and don't oversell what you can do. And I'm not saying that you know, consultants can't do everything. I know y'all could, y'all could improve the world. You know, I'm not saying that. Before. But as far as the process, a, a, an agency that's going to be doing a local that project is going to have to have some staff involvement, and they're going to have to have that. That consultant can't do everything for that agency, and that agency needs to understand that. And you don't need to oversell that. I'm the magic consultant that can get you through the process with, with no headaches, because that's not going to happen. So I. I just don't oversell what you can do and what you can't do and make sure that your your, the, your client understands what you can't do and what you need them to do. One of the things that we also talked about the other day, and it's something that I know a lot of the agencies uh, deal with, and that is the uh, political part of the equation. Uh, Y'all have to deal directly with your elected officials and the public and a lot of times they don't understand uh, the process say uh, what can say the community what can we do say also to help say the elected officials understand it you know we've tried to do the you know workshops to have them more knowledgeable about it it's it's uh, sometimes hard for them to understand that from an agency standpoint which i'll go through what are some suggestions maybe that we can do to help on that. I know it's a tough question, but hey, Tom, I don't know what you're talking about. My yeah. bosses are perfect. <laughs> and they don't understand everything. So. No, I go, going back to putting put myself as a staff communicating to the elected officials. Once again, I, I think the, the advice to me is the exact advice I just gave to consultants. <clears throat> Explain to the elected official that we're entering into this and that make sure that they know the positives and negatives. Know, that, that I can tell them that, hey, we're probably going to have a problem with utilities, like I said, because we always have a problem with utilities. But also let them know there's also going to be some stuff I have no idea about that's going to come up. And we're going to try to, we're going to mitigate that those issues when they come up. But overall, I, I think that's it. It's easier, I actually think it's easier on, at the county level to do this than it is at the municipality level. But that's just my opinion. Well, that's because you only have to do it with one probably one commissioner on that one project, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I think Matt's right on is spot on. And, and the other part mentioned earlier, um, set some reasonable expectations. You know, I, I think just if you put it out in, a, in positive terms, but in clear terms of what you really can accomplish, uh, that the consultant not overselling or whatever you want to say, not not being too optimistic. I mean, we know how commissioners are and, and uh, elected officials everywhere. Just as I am, I'm impatient. I want the project done. But the, the reality is the folks in this room are the doctor when it comes to this and you have to tell them the truth. And so I think if you can, can communicate that up front and, and keep in contact with them, uh, it helps. And you know, my project was was well behind its bid schedule, its original bid schedule. Uh, I won't say that that was, I inherited it. I wouldn't say that it was 
necessarily overly optimistic, but the problems that Matt and I have talked about are the problems that got in the way of it getting getting out on time. But it's out on the out on the street. We're putting down concrete, and everybody's smiling now. Thank y'all. We've got time for a few questions, or is probably as important too for us. What we want to try to do is any lessons learned, uh, kind of similar situations that the group can share uh, with some of the others. Um, you know, say as they pointed out, sometimes you know having say a challenge is not always a negative. It, it helps us all to expect the unexpected, and that's how you learn, and that's how you make the process better. So. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Yes, sir. One for Matt. Matt, you, you said uh, make sure you're uh, picking the right project for federal funding participation. Uh, and you mentioned a few that you thought were. I didn't hear you say which ones weren't. So, uh, and uh, so a lot of times the like leaders just think the federal money is uh, almost like free money. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate your thoughts about what might not be the best way, best kind of project uh, to look for federal funding for. And Alan, I, you, you ask these hard questions because you know, yeah, everybody sees, oh, great, we can submit to the tip, and there's 80 percent contribution that saves the county 80 percent of the project. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, let's do that on every project. But I do think, and I think this answer varies agency to agency. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a consistent thing throughout. But I do know, uh, looking at that agency's budget, how much can you commit to projects? <coughs> to some extent, some of the some projects make more sense at a local level. You know, we had a we had a project um, that was mainly intersection improvements, pedestrian improvements. Uh, had a con. Uh, uh, commissioner will want to put that into the tip at the last tip call, and that project doesn't make much sense from a, a tip standpoint. That's a local project that we can do, that we that we ought to find a place in our budget, and we have found a place in our budget for that project. And by doing that, we're probably going to we're we're going to deliver the project much faster. Uh, we're going to deliver the project cheaper. Now, maybe not cheaper than the 20% that we that would have been the local match, but it's actually cheaper than what we'd ended up doing if we had went through the federal process, and, and probably not that much higher than our 20%, because we, we can use more of our local standards in that situation. We can, the time, there, it, the, it, we can use some of our local standards. We're still going by Ashdu and all that other stuff. But there's just some cost savings there that we don't have to work through in working through uh, the tech stop process. And also there is a time value of, of money here a little bit too, where that project if it would have gotten selected might have gotten selected in the 10-year plan in 2021, 2022, somewhere along there. I can deliver it in 18. So there is a time value of money there also. So that's kind of what I, for Brazoria County, I know we're looking at size projects, limiting that we're, these small local projects we can handle on our own and we need to handle on our own. Any other questions? Yes, Chris. Question for Dallas. I know HGAC has implemented a monitoring system where quarterly they, they track the progress and the status of, of these projects. And I was just wondering how useful that is for you as the local government sponsor how you relate with HJC is their monitoring. If the project gets behind the schedule, does that help you in trying to develop a recovery plan? <laughs> the panel. Well, I can tell you it causes a whole lot of angst among some of the, some of the sponsors. You know, I, I can't can't tell you how many times I saw Trent Everson grimace when he had a black ball on his project, which was, which was the code, was a black ball meant you were behind. The, the real challenge for all of us in that is that that's somewhat of an indicator, but it doesn't tell the story. Uh, you know, just because you got a green ball and you're, and you're good to go because you're at a certain spot based on where the letting date is set, um, that that feels it's a feel good and it's certainly it, what it does more than anything is it opens the dialogue and I think that's the important part of it so whether it's a black ball or a red ball or a yellow or a green it still just really helps with the dialogue I, I don't see it having 
a, a an effect, uh, except it, it brings it to everybody's attention, and we've and we begun to push. I, we'll see. It's still evolving. I think it's it's got a lot of potential to help more. But uh, in terms of what we're actually getting done, um, a lot of times those obstacles that turn that ball to a different color, other than green, are things that are beyond the control of the uh, of the local entity. I have an ITS project that, that we've got engineering in and construction in, and appropriately, TechStop uh, set the priority for the AFA on that behind some other projects that have a much earlier construction date. So on HGAC's report, I'm behind schedule on the first part of it, which is design. It has no, no effect on implementation, uh, other than we want to implement early, and so if we can get the project going, then we feel like we can maybe be ready if there's money available in an earlier year, we can, we can be able to get something else on the ground to help our folks. So I think it's a positive thing, but it's not it's not really definitive, I guess, in terms of uh, folks taking uh, personal concern about it. Uh, and it. But it helps. It's a dialogue that's helping the process. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? get delayed for so many reasons you know some of it is what Richard's talking about and, and not pointing the finger at tech stop because I don't want my risk assessment grade to go down <laughs> but, <laughs> but tech stop has priorities that they have to you know they, they have to, they have to work on first and so there's there, there's phases of the project that gets delayed because of that there's also uh, it, it could be it could be text audit, it could be a local issue, it could be right of way, it could be utilities. There's so it, it could be a consultant. And I'm not once again, I, you know, sometimes the consultant has some priorities. They they book projects that they want to plan on booking or other projects jump in priority and they can't work on yours right away. So there's a lot of reasons why projects get behind. I, I'm just gonna go back, David, I think, and answer the you know, answer the answer it with one of my first talking points and one of Richard's talking points. Communication, when, when you fall behind, you got to identify what the problem is and why are you falling behind, and then address that problem. And usually that takes a multifaceted approach with all, all stakeholders in the project, the tech stock, the consultant, the local entity, trying to figure out how you're going to get there. Um, that, that's all I got for you. Other than that, I don't know. We'll see. I got a few that are behind. We'll see if I, if I know what I'm talking about. Any other questions? A good deal. Oh. Oh, Dave, do we need to go? Yes. Okay, then I'll hold my question. Oh, we got time? Let's see. Oh, we do have time. Well, oh. I, I'm going to segue a little bit onto uh, Mr. Wordlow. So, Matt and Richard, uh, you both came out of the consultant industry to your county engineer jobs. How has that made you be a better county, enge county engineer, or has it? <laughs> well, you made a pretty broad assumption there that we're better county engineers. I don't know about that. Uh, you know, I, from my perspective, uh, my experience a lot was on the development side, which which in Fort Bend County we deal with a lot. So it's not really a textile related answer, but um, but it is in a way. And it's when when you're in the consultant business, your job is to deliver on a commitment. Um, and it's to, it's to see and guide your client to get them to a successful completion of a project. Having been through that with multiple agencies in the region and the state, and then sit on the other side of the table and try to help folks through that process, um, you know, my mantra with my staff is we're, we're, we're trying to be a resource to help folks get through and comply. We're not a regulatory punitive group now. 
there are folks out there that are in a pinch and they think we are. But but we're really at the end of the day, I always try to we try to keep an attitude of of helping get through the process. How do we solve this problem rather than just getting in the way? And I think that if anything, that's the biggest advantage of being on the private side and the public side is being able to see how much how important that is to be able to to look at it from a different perspective and not just start out as we're the county and by God you're gonna comply with our regulations. Good, can't have anything to Okay. Let's give these uh, gentlemen a round of applause. Thank you. housekeeping things again uh, for the PEs, uh, PDHs, go ahead and you can drop me off your card still before the end of the day and I will get you uh, the certificates for that. Um, several folks have asked if these slides again in the proceedings will be on the HGAC website. Yes, we will make those available.